Paul Sperry, uh, he he gets a lot of scoops. We've had him on the show before. He does these deep investigations for Real Clear. And um, he's sent out a couple of tweets citing a source close to the judge. Now, we don't know whether this person actually is in a a position to know what the judge is thinking, but the second tweet, we brought the first one to our audience last week, the second Paul Sperry tweet reads as follows. Judge McAfee views cell phone data and the Terrence Bradley texts as suggestive but not dispositive or as enough proof to settle the matter, according to an Atlanta attorney familiar with his thinking. Texts provide no insight into how Terrence Bradley would know, meaning uh, that they had an affair long before 2022. Did he see them? Wade told him. Now that is an interesting thought that the judge is getting ready to dismiss evidence of the cell phone data, the many texts between these two mm-hmm. long before they admit their affair took place and the middle of the night visits as the texts yeah. uh, seem to suggest and so on. And also yeah. Bradley's texts to um, Nathan Wade yeah. or to, to Ashley Merchant saying, you know, it began well before because he's saying the texts don't actually show Bradley had personal knowledge of it could have been speculation. Well, if any of that is true, how do you, how do you see it? That's just dead wrong. There are people on death row. I have a client in prison on far, far less compelling evidence of uh, pings and tweets and cell hours. She put people in prison based on that. If this judge doesn't conclude beyond any doubt that there was an improper relationship, also, is there any doubt that she never paid back the money? Uh, what lawyer who has to comply with ethics rules would ever not have a record of paying back money You have bank deposits, withdrawals, you have a photograph of the money being paid. But for her to make up a story that she paid the money back and has one piece of evidence that once she paid for a wine tasting with cash, there are so many people in prison for long term on less evidence than that. If this judge doesn't believe that or says he doesn't believe it, he wouldn't be telling the truth. I can tell you with 100 percent certainty that this judge sitting there knows absolutely that this affair occurred before, that the money wasn't paid back, that they committed perjury, that they conspired to commit perjury. But judges sometimes pretend that they don't believe testimony or believe testimony in order to spare themselves. He doesn't want to look the elected DA in the eye and say, you're a perjurer, you should be in prison. But there's absolutely no doubt that there's enough here to disqualify. And if he doesn't disqualify, uh, this whole case uh, will be Uh, subject to all kinds of criticism, not only in the court of public opinion, but in the courts of law as well. I hope the judge does the right thing, but I've said from the beginning, I don't think he will. I don't think he has the guts. I don't think he has the courage to tell the truth. And I think he'll find a way to weasel out of this thing to say, oh, well, the the cell tower, who are you going to believe? Me or your lying eyes? Look, she and he had an affair before they were appointed. That is absolutely clear. And her testimony under oath is perjury. The evidence is overwhelming as to that. And if the judge pretends not to believe it, there's a bridge in Brooklyn that I could sell him as well. But judges do that all the time. Yes. You know, cops yep. uh, arrest people. They say the drug dealer dropped the drugs on the floor. That's lie number seven on the list of 10 lies. Uh, dropsy testimony. And I've looked in the eyes of judges and they say, well, we believe this testimony. And then, you know, two years later, after court, you talk to the judge. And they'll say, of course, I never believed it. Of course, I knew he was lying. But I, you know, the person was guilty. And I just didn't want the person to get off. Judges play that game all the time. And if this judge tries to play that game now, a lot of lawyers and a lot of people like you and me are going to be after him because it will be a disgrace to the judicial system if she's allowed to continue. It's a disgrace to the legal system if she's not disbarred and not put in jail. And I hope the people of Fulton County have enough sense to throw her out of office, at least when it comes to an election. All right, a couple of questions on that. It, could the judge, because I, I do want to talk about what import we glean from the dismissal of those six counts. I mean, but, but let me just table that for one second, table it for one second and ask you, do, do you think there's a way in which this judge could say, mm, I'm not going to kick her off this case. I'm not going to maybe even kick Nathan Wade off the case, though I think, you know, most people agree he's probably gone. But let's say he, he says, I'm not going to kick them off the case. Any disciplinary matters involving their misleading of this court really are a matter for the bar 
And so I don't, I don't approve of it. I don't like it, but I don't see his grounds for disqualification. This is really just an ethical matter for the bar. He could say that. That would be a, a cop out. Uh, but he could say that. And also, I think his dismissal of the six counts uh, basically was a message based, see, I'm fair. Uh, I don't rule in favor of her every time. I took that dismissal of the six counts as a signal that he was not going to disqualify the whole office. Otherwise, he mm. would have waited to see uh, whether the new office was going to stand by that or maybe reindict. So I think that your source is probably correct. And you know, uh, I think it was Levin on uh, Fox News who called me the, the Nostradamus of uh, of lawyers because I get my predictions right all the time because I don't make predictions based on wishful thinking. Uh, so my prediction here is that he's going to figure out a way of not completely and totally disqualifying them. Maybe he'll say there's an appearance, but the appearance isn't enough under the law. But whatever he says, if he suggests that you can believe anything she said, he should not be on the bench because he would not be telling the truth. He does not mm -hmm. believe her. I guarantee you, he's smart enough. Do you know anybody who actually, even CNN, even CNN, many of their legal commentators who were always wrong say they didn't believe her. They didn't believe, I mean, it's not enough here to disqualify, but we don't believe her. If you don't believe her, she's committed perjury. And if you don't believe both of them, they've committed perjury, obstruction of justice, and conspiracy to commit perjury. Again, let me emphasize one more time. She put people in prison on less evidence than is now against her. What hypocrisy. All right. So the judge issues this decision dismissing six counts of the indictment. I agree. My first instinct when I saw it was he's trying to show yeah. I did something that was good for Trump. And then maybe later this week, he's going to say, and I did something that was good for Trump's prosecutor by keeping right. Fannie Willis on the case. Uh, I think we can probably glean he's definitely not going to grant the motion to dismiss this case entirely because of Fannie's alleged conflict, because no, why else right. would he be that, reducing right six decision. counts from it? Yeah, yeah. That's okay, the right so that's decision. not, I don't think the case is not going to go case. away. Yeah. All right, so that's that. Here's another thing that we found this soundbite from the judge speaking with the local radio station last week. And he was being asked, Alan, about the, his new left-wing challenger to his judge seat, which he's now got to run for re-election on. He was unchallenged. And then at the last minute, this guy who's from the Rainbow Push Jesse Jackson Coalition throws his hat in the ring and he's now challenging him from the left. And he was asked about that and how, if at all, it might weigh on his decision over Fanny. And here's what he said. I had a rough draft and an outline before I ever heard a rumor that someone wanted to run for this position. So the result is not going to change because of politics. I am calling it as best I can in the law as I, as I understand it. Okay. Yeah. Now, my very smart law school friend who listens to the show every day, she's a lawyer like you and I are, and she says... She thinks from that, and I think she's got a good point. He's pro the only reason he would remind us that he had drafted an, a, a decision before he got the challenge from the left would be if he's about to rule that Fanny can stay on the case, because he wouldn't need to reassure us that he had pr drafted anything to you know deal with a competitor if it was going to be against Fanny, right? Like heard, he wouldn't draft an opinion getting rid of Fanny in order to appease the left. So it, I do, I think she might be onto something there. That that tell that statement may have telegraphed he's about to rule in favor of Fanny Willis staying on the case. What do you think? I agree. I agree with that. I think all the signs point in that direction, and all the law and the facts point in the opposite direction. But I don't think this judge is going to do justice in this case. I think he is going to figure out a way of not having her disqualified. Look, uh, the worst what thing What about that Nathan Wade, though? What about Nathan? Yeah, I know you won't go as far as say well, Fanny in the office, but what about Nathan Wade? That's easy. He could say, look, uh, the appearance of justice, I recommend strongly that he be taken off the case so that the appearance of injustice uh, disappears. That would be an easy call for him, but it would have no impact. Uh, on the case. Look, uh, the worst thing that ever happened to American judicial system is uh, election of judges, election of prosecutors. We're the only country in the world, in the Western world, that elects judges and prosecutors. And the politics obviously play a role in all of these decisions. So, uh, but I agree with your friend. I think she's very insightful that um, mm. that statement suggests 
that uh, he he is not going to uh, rule in favor of of, of Donald Trump uh, on on the on the disqualification. Again, that's my judgment. I don't have enough to make a firm prediction, but uh, uh, I, I hope he rules the other way. But I often predict against my own wishes, so that's my right. that's my prediction. All right. Yeah. So let's say let let's get ahead of ourselves a bit and say he keeps her on the case, irrespective yeah. of what happens with Nathan Wade. That he keeps yeah. Fannie Willis on the case. What what happens as a, as a realistic matter in now her prosecution against Donald Trump and these defendants now that the whole nation has had quite an introduction to this woman and her ethical bar? Well, first of all, it becomes a big appellate issue. Second of all, good trial lawyers could try to figure out a way of getting her credibility somehow in front of the jury. It's not an easy thing to do, but uh, the American public does not believe Phony Willis. They don't believe she's a truth teller. And uh, if I'm a defense attorney, I try to take as much advantage of that in every single context, both the trial and on appeal. So she's become a big issue now in this case. If she had been smart, she just would have recused herself, not the office, just recused herself and recused him and said, this is bigger than both of us. Let's get on with this. But she has an enormous ego. The fact that she volunteered the testimony and bolted into the courtroom and began to tell what I regard as lie after lie after lie uh, shows, I think, what kind of a person she is. And uh, I, I would not be proud of that. Financial experts thought we were in the clear. They were anticipating around six rate cuts by the Fed this year. And then the inflation data came out. Did you see the latest? Higher than expected. This is obviously not going away. How can it? The U.S. is $34 trillion in the hole. Oh. And yet we just keep on printing money which pushes the prices you pay every day even higher. So you can either bury your head in the sand or you can do something about it. One option to consider is to diversify a portion of your savings into gold with Birch Gold Group. Gold can be your hedge against inflation, you see, and Birch Gold makes it easy to own. They will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold, and you don't pay a penny out of pocket. Text Megan, M-E-G-Y-N, to 989898 and get your free info kit on gold. And then speak with a precious metal specialist about how you can choose to protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Text Megan to 989898 now. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.